Morning guys. We're playing in the airplane factory today. Gonna get started back on this little project again. So, several things. I've just been assessing the, the situation the last couple of days. I'm still cleaning up my mess back here. I still don't have everything rearranged or everything back to where I can utilize the space again. But that will slowly come and I can do a few things right now. Um, I think part of the reason that I got off of this project for a while was I kind of stalled out a little bit on the flapperons more than anything else. And I've got flapperons here, well, I've got part of them on the bench, part of them are leaning back here, and I've got slats laying here. And I'm working on a little bit of both of those today. Slats wise, I've got to go back and reskin one outboard flap, and I'm not sure which one it is, but um, I've got um, the ribs and everything here, and I evidently, well, I know I messed up one of the one of the flap skins, probably the last one that I was doing. But anyway, enough to where I needed to redo it. So not a major, major thing. I've got to start over materials. I'm still making a list of what I need to restock on. But uh, I pulled my slat jig back down. It's been hanging up in the rafter. So of course now it's got a nice little warp to the base of it. So we may have to we may have to put a different piece of plywood on the bottom of that. Um, I may hose it down, set it out in the sun on a flat surface and see if it'll straighten itself out. But that's not a real big issue either. The main part of the slat jig is fine. So today I'm kind of working on the uh, end caps that go in the slat. And this is what I've come up with. Now this will be radius down on this back corner. But this is the beginning of a plug and I think I'm going to use this plug. Um, I was only going to do just a foam plug for the left and right end, but I need two of each, uh, you know, inboard and outboard on each wing. So I need um, two rights and two lefts. So what I'm probably going to do is end up and build a, probably a fiberglass plug. These are going to be in carbon fiber, is what they're going to ultimately be in. But this is kind of what I have came up with. And I had pulled a couple of fiberglass plugs previously when I was working on this before. And uh, I've got them laying here. I don't like the shape of them, so they're going, they're going in the scrap. And the attitude that I'm taking right now on most of this stuff is I'm going back, I'm reassessing the work I've done in the past, um, which I'm not unhappy with any of the work I've done in the past, but my skills and my level of craftsmanship that I want to show on this has changed a little bit, um, as well as a little bit of the mission of this plane, but I'm not going to get into that. So... Um, Today I've got the, the hot wire cutter out. I'm just going to cut a couple of blanks. I've got the first one cut already for this out of this pink foam. And I'm going to cut a second one. So if I decide I need to, to reshape both of them and work on them, why, that'll be done. So I've got those done. The, um, the elevator that's hanging on the plane out there, I've discovered on one end I've whacked it. And that's part of the problem with me not continuing to work on this and having such a small space. And I, in all honesty, don't know how that got damaged. I looked at that. I could straighten it up, um, maybe replace the end rib, and it would be fully functional. It's got a little bit of a little bit of a dink in the aluminum right on one end, and I think probably I'm probably going to replace the whole thing. We'll probably rebuild the whole thing. Um, I haven't decided for certain yet. I'll pull it off and take a look at it when I get that far and, and decide then. But um, there again, I think it's, I would be a little bit happier with it. Got the one wing all skinned, the top is clecoed on, the bottom's all riveted up. Uh, there again, put a scrape in the, in the top skin. Whether I replace that or not, I don't know yet. We'll, we'll look and see. The other wing skeleton is hanging here, and uh, it's ready to be pretty much, uh, there's a few rivets that need to go in on it, on the, on the bracing and stuff. When we get it down on the table, I will. We'll look at it again and um, go from there. I've got the four tanks sitting here. The, the tanks themselves and the ends are all formed and they're, the main bodies of the tanks are tack welded together. I still need to put the fillers in and any fittings that are gonna, gonna be welded in. But I need to get back on those, get those a um, little bit farther along and welded up. So we'll get back on that little project too. I've got the fifth bearing castings are um, they're ready to be finished out for the fifth bearing on the Corvair engine. And that's kind of where we're at. So we're going to see more of this content. This today is just me doing this because I want to do it for me. You know, it's not me working on anybody else's projects. I've got other things I need to do. But um, today's the day I'm 
working on stuff I want to be working on. So I'll take you along for part of it. Hopefully you find something a little bit useful and interesting there. And um, we'll go from there. So anyway, I've got the blank for the second hot wire out here. Let me just move the camera down so you can see the, the foam cutter. My little setup is, you've probably seen it before, got a home built um, foam cutter. I've got a battery charger hooked up to it. Rheostat on the other side, and that's all there is to it. main thing I found with a foam cutter is try and keep consistent pressure going on one direction all the time otherwise it's gonna going to want to walk it on in and out a little bit and you don't get a nice consistent cut especially when you're going through thicker foam like this basically all we want is the base shape which is the, the portion that's up and then we'll uh, we'll form the rest of it off of the by hand Maybe you get a little bit of wave here, but like I say, we'll sand down off of that. There's the base of our blank, and the rest of it. So we'll just sand her down. Probably take a uh, probably take a rasp to it just to knock down most of the outer outer crap on the edge. And we'll go back and sand it. And you can take and sand this with about 80 grit, and, and it'll take it down to take it down pretty quickly. There we go. There's our bases, left and right. So anyway, I'm going to put this mess away, and I'm probably going to work on uh, slats a little bit. We'll figure out exactly what we're doing there. Alright, we're still assessing the situation here. On the flapperons, I'm going to reskin all four of them. I'm going to redo one spar, and it's a spar that I've drilled top and bottom. Um, got one end on a rib that's um, I don't like an edge distance on so we're just going to change the spar out. Um, spar and new ribs on all of them, not a big deal to to reform those. <coughs> so that's the status of that. Spar material, I've been kind of going through assessing what material I still have here in stock and everything. I've still got a little bit of 16th thou. Not enough I don't believe to do any skins. I'm going to have to order some 16th thou which I need to finish out uh, wings anyway. But um, 25 thou, I had a fairly nice looking four foot wide piece still back here in the shop. And for a length on that for this one, and this is a outboard spar I believe, I needed, how much did I need? I needed uh, 1790. And the length of this sheet is... <laughs> 1773 I'm 17 millimeters short so I'm ecstatic which is okay I mean we'll order some 25 thou too or we're, we're working up that list I think I need some 25 thou for some other stuff anyway so not a big deal so that's where we're at the only other thing I wanted to talk about and then I'll close this out is corrosion protection and I watched a video of somebody building a zenith the other day that showed 
him holding up a can of Krylon self-etching primer. And as you know, I'm a fan of priming. And what I and what I normally use is, and this is an older can, I've got to get some new, but I use the Duplicolor self-etching primer. It's quick, it's convenient, I can almost always get a fresh can up at my local O'Reilly's, although I was up there the other day and they didn't have any in stock, and prices jumped on it quite a bit here, so anyway, that's the way it is. I will continue to use this. I am definitely an advocate of priming, and when I prime this stuff, I prime rivet lines, edge lines, like on this piece. I prime down in between these two parts. Anytime we've got steel going to prevent gal galvanic action, why well, I'm priming in between, and that's inside and out, and that's the extent of what I prime. Now, primers like this self-etching primer, unless they're a primer sealer, are hydroscopic, which means they will absorb moisture. Guys will say that that's a big deterrent to using any of these primers like this, unless it's a primer sealer, which you'll normally put right underneath your top coat or whatever your paint is. They say it adds weight, and, and this gentleman the other day that was working on his said there was absolutely no reason to prime. All it did was add weight. Since it was hydroscopic, it, uh, it, did, it would absorb moisture. It did absolutely nothing for it, so there was no reason to prime. And my feeling is everybody needs to make their own decisions with their own research with, and make an informed decision about what you're going to do. I feel it's very necessary, and we're not adding that much weight. I have etched it with this self-etching primer to give the primer a good bite, and yes, it is hydroscopic. Now, I don't feel that the amount of moisture that it's going to absorb in this little thin coating is going to make any difference, because when you go to top coat it, it's going to hopefully be dry, clean, all that good stuff. You're going to have lightly sanded it again if necessary, whatever, whatever preparation you need to do to um, get good adhesion for your top coats and I feel that it gives you some protection both in between these and um, between any steel you know that you're gonna that this is going to attach to also so I think it's worth doing the and I've heard several arguments from well I'm not gonna live long enough for this to fall apart or deteriorate or be corroded that bad and, and things like that. I'm not building this airplane for, I'm building this airplane for me because this is my fun project and I build stuff. But in essence this and the next airplane that I start on hopefully is being built for my son. These go to him and why would I not offer him the best things that I can give him as we go on. Now this right here is the perfect example of why I think it's necessary to prime. Now this is a piece of 16,000, 6061. It's been rolled and set on the floor here, out here. And this is a wooden floor. Not, as far as I know, in contact with any really bad stuff or anything that should cause this. This is not a heated space, so in the winter it basically gets to be the same as ambient temperature inside or outside. And um, this is what I find this morning on this, or this afternoon when I'm looking at this. And all this through there is corrosion on there. Same way on the other side. And if we continue to look down this, and I don't know how well this is going to show up, but um, along this edge down through here, I'm looking at it on this side. This still has the plastic coating on it, and it's on both sides. This side doesn't have the plastic coating on it, but actually I just peeled the plastic coating off of this side. But um, we've got corrosion all the way along there. That right there is enough to convince me to prime all my aircraft surfaces. Uh, this piece has been around any place from probably three to seven years. I don't know exactly how long. I think from the cut on this, this was probably a fuselage side is what was cut out of this sheet. Now this is the factory edge. This is not my cut edge. So, and this was, all of my 16,000s has come from from aircraft spruce. Now this is not not slamming aircraft spruce at all because I don't believe it's their fault. You know, this is this is just something that's happened here and I don't know I don't know why, I don't know where. But that's enough to convince me that it is worthwhile priming. 
um, the amount of the amount of moisture that hydroscopic primers like this are going to absorb, I think, is minimal. In in normal preparation to top coat these, why it's going to be a non-issue as far as any moisture that may have been absorbed over time with this. Um, I prime all my rivet lines. I prime all my mating surfaces with just a light coat, and I think that's all it takes. Now, Zenith recommends Cortec, which they will supply. I was just reading the data sheet on Cortec the other day, and it is also hydroscopic. So, um, you know, make your own choices as to whether you want to do that or not. But when I see stuff like this, why that, that convinces me, even though 6061 is fairly corrosion resistant, it will still corrode. Now, this is not bad enough to where this is going to be an issue. This would clean off and uh, clean up and would be perfectly fine, you know, but it will corrode, you know, so why would you not offer the best protection you can on your airplane, you know, no matter what environment you're in. It, it, everybody says, well, my airplane's always going to be hangered. Well, there's going to be some time when it's going to be sitting out in the weather, you know, maybe it's only overnight as you're going someplace, maybe you're going to get caught in a rainstorm someplace, who knows. But anyway, that's all I got. That's my little rant. Comments, suggestions, leave them in the comments section for me below. Hope you find some of this useful, and as always, guys, thanks for taking the time to watch.